So today we are on our uh, fourth week of our Lenten sermon series, um, On the Way to the Cross. Um, We're trying to take a deep dive into scripture and understanding uh, of what it is that scripture is actually saying, what the text actually, topic for all of us, right, is the one thing we may lack, that we are not perfect, we're imperfect, and So we will never make it to heaven on our own. We need a savior. And then last week we talked about the idea that we are called to serve and not be served. Which one of the things we talked about is hard for us to deal with as many churches, all churches. It's not about us. It's about those not with us, right? So we even looked uh, into the reason why we serve. Are we serving for the pat on the back? Are we serving... Because Christ has called us to and we want to grow the kingdom. But we also leaked a little bit into the idea for this week's sermon. And you'll see that here in a little bit. Um, If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be reading from the book of Luke chapter 19 verses 11 through 26 here in a little bit. And while you look that up, like always, i got to ask you a question to check your pulse. Make sure you're awake, especially with daylight savings time and everything. And... And uh, hour ahead, because maybe you didn't get your coffee in. All right? So, um, do any of you have that friend or that family member um, that is annoying (laughs) because everything they do, they are really good at? Yeah, right? Aren't they the most annoying person in the world? It just stinks. You're good at everything, right? It's just frustrating uh, to to deal with that. Like um, they could walk out tomorrow and pick up a hobby and the next week they're like way above average. It's like, this is not okay, right? It's frustrating. Um, Some of them even like the next day, I remember a kid I went to high school with like snowboarded and like the next day he was going off jumps. After he learned that, I'm like, ah, dude, I'm still trying not to fall on my face, right? Um, <laughs> it, it, it's tough, and, and I feel like um, it's tough to be around, but I feel like when the closer you are to them, the more it's annoying. And the person in my life growing up was always my brother, okay? I swear my brother came out of the womb throwing 80 miles an hour. Okay, he just always had a cannon, and, and he was the MVP of multiple little leagues and multiple different things for throwing the ball harder than anybody else when we were young. Um, and then he was faster than everybody in his class. He was, he, he was one of the fastest runners in the class. And, and every time uh, from a very young age, and, and this isn't probably as normal in some families, our family was a bowling family. It, it, when you were four, you started bowling. It was expected, okay? <laughs> my, all the way back to my grandma made my, my dad and his brothers do it. Um, but uh, uh, it was super cool because one year I said, I did something better than my brother because there wasn't my age group for city tournament in Davenport. So I had to bowl up an age group and I won city. I'm like, heck yeah. So Matt went to state and qualified in the top three. I hate you. Why? <laughs> No matter what, it was just always better, right? Um, It was bigger tournament, better things, whatever it may be. Um, And and, uh, he was one of those people that also, it wasn't just sports. Like, he was one of those people that would sleep through class or not go and then take a test he never learned about and get an A. I would study all flipping week and get a C, and I'm like, good job, I hate you, Matt. I just hate you. And then, of course, uh, um, two, uh, where was it? Two years ago, uh, uh, I've been coaching for how many? 19 years. I think I've actually been coaching. Yeah, I've been coaching longer than he has. Coaching for 19 years. Finally got to the Dome. Final four. Woohoo. Matt saw, just won his fifth national title yesterday. <laughs> He's such a butthead. <laughs> It's infuriating. And even when we were little, 
My, my uncle and my cousin are like 10 years older than us because, yeah, long story. Anybody have a family? Yeah, it's weird. Anyways, they're 10 years older than us, so they always encourage bad things. So they got his boxing gloves. Really bad idea. Well, I've always been the big one. My brother was like a sprinter. Okay. Yes. <laughs> I ran into people, so I didn't have to run more than 40 yards, okay? Uh, but it, it's like, okay, cool. We, we're boxing. All I had to do was land one, and then he'd hit me 20 times before I could throw a punch. It just wasn't fair. But it, uh, um, you'd think after all that it, it would be something that uh, uh, be over, but it was always defeating. It was something that always hit me, and it, it never felt right, and I never thought I was going to be good enough because everybody compared us, right? He was the 400, 800 runner, and all I ran track for was because I wanted to get faster for football. I wanted to run sprints. First day at track practice, they told me, hey, you're running long distance. Run a five-mile run. No! So everybody knows where Assumption's at, right? I'll tell you the trick we did, because my track coach is dead now probably, so I, I won't get yelled at. Um, he used to make us run all the way down to the river and back. And so we would run from Assumption to the donut place by Central, have a donut while we waited for the other runners to go back by, have a donut and milk, and then jog the rest of the way back. Because we couldn't come in first, because he'd know, right? <laughs> it was. It's all uphill. That's why we stopped before the downhill. <laughs> we were no dummies, right? But anyways, I never wanted to run again, because comparing myself to him, comparing myself to whatever, I never ran track, and I eventually quit baseball because of it. But let's see here in a sec how that's going to relate as well, uh, uh, to our story from Luke, chapter 9, verses 11 through 26. As they listened to this, Jesus told them another parable because he was near Jerusalem. They thought the kingdom would appear right away. He said, a certain man who was born into royalty went to a distant land to receive his kingdom and then return. He called together ten servants and gave each of them money worth four months' wages. He said, do business with this until I return. His citizens hated him, so they sent a representative after him and said, we don't want, to, sorry, we don't want this man to be our king. After receiving his kingdom, he returned and called the servants to whom he had given the money to find out how much they had earned. The servants came forward and said, your money has earned a return of 1,000%. The king replied, excellent, you are a good servant because you have been faithful in a small matter. You will be authority over 10 cities. The second servant came, said to master, your money has made a return of 500%. To this, the king said, you will have authority over five cities. Another servant came and said, Master, here is your money. I wrapped it in a scarf for safekeeping. I was afraid because you are a stern man. You withdraw what you haven't deposited and you harvest what you haven't planted. The king replied, I will judge you by the words of your own mouth, you worthless servant. You knew, did you, that I'm a stern man, withdrawing what I didn't deposit and harvesting what I didn't plant. Why then didn't you put my money in the bank? Then when I arrived, at least I could have gotten it back in with interest. He said to his attendants, take his money. Give it to the one who had ten times as much. But master, they said, he already has ten times as much. He replied, I said to you that everyone who has will be given more. But those who have nothing, even what they have, will be taken away. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this parable, 
I think it's kind of easy if we look into it to piece together what Jesus is kind of trying to say to us, right? It's more of a common parable, so maybe we've looked at it one way or the other. But Jesus is actually speaking to his disciples and explaining to them that he's about to go away for a long time. Does anybody catch that in the story? The nobleman that Jesus is teaching about is going away. What's about to happen? Jesus is about to go away for a long time. And I'm, he's trying to tell him, I'm about to be arrested. I'm about to be beaten and eventually sentenced to death. But I'm going to be raised again. But eventually, even after that, I'm going to be longer. So you need to understand this parable. Jesus is saying, I am the noble man. I'm leaving for this long time, but I've left each of you with gifts. I've left you with my teachings. I've left you with, with all of these things, and you're going to be getting a special gift soon after I'm gone. This is a big deal. Pay attention. Go and take these 10 minutes and, and, and doubles or uh, grows it by 10 uh, times. That person, that servant knew exactly what he was supposed to do. He knew what he had been given and he knew what Jesus had called him to do. He knew he was supposed, or the, sorry, the, the nobleman had called him to do. Jesus was definitely a Freudian slip there, but it works. He said, I'm going to go out and, and do everything I can to make my king proud and help him grow his kingdom and his wealth. Then he reached his second servant, and the servant, had the gifts and graces he had been given, went five times, or 50 times more, 500 times more, sorry. And, and all right, awesome. You still did really good. You did everything you could. You used the gifts that I had given you, and you did great things. You grew the kingdom. You grew my wealth. Well done. But let's face it. Uh, about it, uh, uh, this, or sorry, let's face this, is God doesn't measure his kingdom in, in wealth, right? He doesn't measure his kingdom in how, how much money uh, uh, you can earn and how much you can do this by. If, if you go by this story just in itself and you don't look at what it's representing, it sounds more like a, a Valhalla story, right? Does anybody know how Vikings used to Vikings used to be buried with their treasure, and the more treasure they were buried with, the more they would have in, in Valhalla, and the more cool and powerful they would be. That's not Jesus, okay? <laughs> so if you look directly at it and read through it, you could get caught in something like that. But that's not what it is. And you learn that from the last who did nothing but hid it. He hid that treasure in the ground. Said, I'm going to protect it this way. What are you going to do? What are you afraid of? Well, he's afraid he was going to fail. He was afraid that, that in his mind that maybe he wasn't good enough. He couldn't grow it. And he used the excuse, well, I know you're this, I know you're that. But the truth is, all of that equates to fear. All of it equals fear. Because at the end of the day, if he does everything he can and he fails and came back with nothing, don't you think the master would probably be more understanding because he tried? But this man was afraid he wasn't good enough. He wouldn't measure up to the other two and he would fall on his face. I think a lot of times in the church, we can relate to this story, especially of the third man. So often we compare ourselves like I did to my brother and say, my talent isn't enough. The gifts God has given me isn't enough for me to make a difference. I'm not enough. My gift is not something that can help grow the kingdom of God. 
but we've talked about this in previous weeks. God gave us specific gifts and graces to help grow his kingdom. And they're specific to us for a reason and maybe even for certain people. And it might be scary for us to step out and be bold enough to step out and do whatever it is that God is calling us to do to grow his kingdom. But, let's see if we're practiced enough yet, if it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you, right? If it doesn't challenge you, it doesn't change you. There's two factors on top of that that we also have to think about. One, the first one we'll talk about, okay, is we're already told in Scripture, in Isaiah 55, 11, when his word goes out, it does not come back empty. It does not say, if, if you're good at putting his word out there, it won't come back empty. It just says, if his word, if it's from him, if it's the Holy Spirit putting it out through you, it won't come back empty. You'll, and you'll hear me say a hundred, maybe a thousand more times, um, God has a purpose for you and your story matters. And this is where you have to hear the second part of this. When you look down on yourself or on your gifts and graces, you are not honoring God's creation. Hmm. Because God created you just the way you are right now, right? Yes, you've made choices. Yes, that's changed your percent, whatever. But if you are dishonoring yourself, and the talents that God gave you to grow his kingdom. And that you're not enough to make a difference. You're saying God messed up. Or God failed. God doesn't fail. If you spend so much time, we all have different skills, so many different abilities... And, and, and it may be to reach this group or that group and nobody else can for one reason or another but if we spend so much time staring and wishing we had somebody else's ability you're going to miss the purpose God has put in your front of your life for a reason so many things I stopped like I said earlier because of being compared to somebody else or me compare, thinking I was compared to somebody else for this reason or that reason. Never ran track again because of one instance in, in freshman year and I didn't want to be compared to my brother in baseball. I quit because uh, uh, my brother could so throw super hard and I always ended up on the batter's box side, right? Where he's throwing because he needed a batter to practice. But I ignored the fact that I became a really good hitter because when you're standing in the batter's box at an 89 mile an hour fastball and then you go play a freshman game and it's only coming at 70, it becomes pretty darn easy. But I didn't pay attention to that. All I saw was, I can't throw 89. From a young age, all I wanted to do was throw like him or do this but I ignored the gift God had given me, so I quit. But it goes further than that, again, uh, uh, because, again, I, I always compared myself and I quit trying in school eventually because I couldn't do it as easily as Matt did, so I quit trying. And I went from a kid that barely graduated high school to now you can ask my wife, I'm upset when I get a B in, in seminary in classes that are a lot harder than the ones I took in high school. Man, I would take a high school class right now. That would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I've never had a high school teacher make me write the amount of papers I do now. <laughs> because I wanted to look at somebody else and be somebody else. 
and I'll carry it till later because this is what pastors are guilty of. And I don't know if you guys know this or not. You may or may not. But as pastors, one of the things we do is we watch so many other sermons during the week. We watch other people and we try and learn from them. But it so quickly goes from, man, I like this preacher to darn it, I'm not that preacher. So easily. There's a certain preacher that, that I always watched and I, I always looked up to and I loved. And then overnight he became like this huge sensation. And I'm like, man, I, I want to be able to preach like him and be able to speak to that many people. Well, now all of a sudden it's, well, you're definitely going to get into heaven if you give more money. Ah. I started idolizing the wrong thing. I started to compare, and I still do it with some of my friends that aren't at that same level. I'll be looking at this pastor and say, oh, he tells such great stories, or this pastor, and man, his theological knowledge is nuts. I wish I had that, and, and this and that, and you compare, and, and it looks horrible, and if I tried to come up here and I tried to be them, there'd be more of you sleeping, <laughs> because that's not me. That's not who God created me to be. But it's not just that kind of thing. We all do that. Some of us um, compare here and there and uh, different things. One of the things I can't compare um, myself to, to another parent that keeps a super clean house because we're not in the same uh, um, uh, situation in life, right? Right? There, that, that everything's always picked up, everything's always this, comparing myself to somebody else who, who maybe doesn't have four kids and doesn't have two people working full time. It's not the same situation, right? It's comparing isn't fair. Or maybe it's uh, uh, other areas, like I can uh, uh, compare my strengths and weaknesses, um, and if we all had the same str strengths and weaknesses, let's face it, life would be boring and nothing would ever get done. Because we'd all not be able to get certain things done. Look at the way you guys fix in the church. Some of you uh, are super skilled at fixing broken pews and or tables or stuff at the church that breaks. And, and, and it's such a wonderful gift to have those people on trustees. But does anybody think we should put somebody on trustees that can't change a light bulb? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Because it's not the gift and grace, maybe. Does that mean that individual has nothing to give? No, absolutely not. Maybe they bake, and they can bake and start doing coffee fellowship and helping out with that. Um, or maybe they're a very good HR person in problem solving, and they're good at being uh, um, uh, confidential. Um, maybe they'd be good serving on SPRC, whereas if somebody else isn't necessarily great at keeping, or keeping co things confidential, maybe they wouldn't be the best for it. Or, or maybe somebody who, like me, every time you put something to bake in the oven, it burns, probably don't want me making coffee fellowship stuff, right? <laughs> wouldn't be the best. Maybe not the best job require our, our, our skills necessary for certain areas, but I guarantee there are places, maybe you're somebody who absolutely loves kids and you want to serve in a youth ministry or hopefully eventually, uh, hopefully eventually we, we can get to that point where we're getting that back and may, or maybe you need to serve in children's ministry or on preschool board or there's so many different gifts and ways to serve. So when somebody says, oh, I don't know where I would serve or, or if I'm any good or if I have any talents for this. Let's schedule a meeting and talk because I bet there is a place God has gifted you. I guarantee it. Because God has put you in this place for a reason. Whether it's in the community and finding a way to serve or here or whatever, God has called you to this life of servanthood. And seriously, I'd love to sit down. If any of you think your skill doesn't fit, I would love to brainstorm with you. 
figure out where it is God is calling you to help grow his kingdom. Because let's face it, there's not a single one of us in here that doesn't one day when we pass want to walk into heaven and hear a very simple phrase. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen?